Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, my fine friends. Welcome to episode nine of season 10 of the Tom Petty Project podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Brown. This is the weekly podcast that digs into the entire Tom Petty catalog song by song, album by album, and includes conversations with musicians, fans, and people connected with Tom along the way. And I said it's episode nine, it's song nine in the Wildflower series season, but it's actually episode 11, but we'll, we'll ignore that for now. Uh, before we cut over to social media, I had a wonderful musical delivery this past Friday. My Mike Campbell and the Dirty Knobs signed copy of Vagabonds, Virgins and Misfits has arrived. And I think I'm going to buy the blue vinyl copy too and frame that up with my signed insert. Um, I'd held off listening to the album until my vinyl copy arrived because I like that to be the first way I listen to records these days, if it's possible. And I got to tell you, it's absolutely fantastic. Mike is just going from strength to strength. Seemingly endless, bottomless well of riffs. Um, his lyrics are getting better and better and cohesively. And overall, I think this is definitely the, the Knob's strongest album. Okay, let's talk about um, Don't Fade On Me, which was two, three weeks ago now. Over on Facebook, uh, we had some good feedback and my executive producer, Paul Roberts, commented, a great pod and brilliant song. Thanks as always, Paul. I always think of it as the dark, brooding cousin of Led Zepp's going to California. Probably nothing musical or lyrically in common, but that's how I roll. It's a 10 for me, too. Uh, JP Kaufman said, Great insights on this one. Thank you. Thank you, JP. Uh, I also learned a lot about the song that I didn't know previously. It feels like such a simple song written alone in the dark at the end of the night when everyone has left the studio. I didn't know so much effort went into it. I always loved Tom's vocals on it, too. I'm so happy to find a community where his vocals are appreciated. We all know that Tom is or was criminally underappreciated by the masses. Uh, is it worth a discussion about why? And I think people dismissing his voice at first listen could be a part of it. Um, I, I love this idea, JP. Um, I would actually really like to get Amy Schaefer over at uh, Virgin Rock onto the show to talk specifically about the technical aspects of Tom's singing. Um, so maybe I'll reach out to her and see if she's up for it. Last week's 10 Questions guest, Mary Beth Donnelly, commented, I really like this line from the alternate recording. Um, I think it's the best line. I really wonder why he dropped it. So don't make me feel a stranger and don't make me feel a fool. Don't make me an outlaw. You said there were no rules. And I didn't get into the alternate version in great depth on the episode because I really wanted to leave that, you know, the contrast and compare more for when I do start tackling those versions as a whole season. And we will be doing a ep- uh, full season on all the rest. Um, and the nice thing about that will be revisiting these songs, but especially the ones that are radically different, which don't fade on me, really is. Nora Haywood Olsen left the following thoughts. For one of my all-time favorite albums, I find that there are several tracks I can only play when I'm in a certain mood. Don't Fade On Me is one of those songs. It can be suited to so many events in a person's life, the dissolving of a friendship, watching a loved one slip away due to dementia, cancer, or other serious health issues, walking with someone as they struggle or lose their battle with addiction or mental health. This tune can even be interpreted as someone saying the lyrics to themselves. Listening to it sometimes can feel like that arrow in the heart logo just pierced mine. And this universality is obviously a recurring theme that we keep returning to, but I love Nora's last sentiment in this comment that the arrow in the heart logo just pierced mine. A very poetic way to phrase it, Nora. Jack McNay starts off by talking about Autotune, which I mentioned fairly briefly in the episode, saying, This was released a few years before Cher put Autotune into the mainstream. So I'd say you're half right in your claim about the days before Autotune. The late producer Steve Albini has cited her hit Believe as a tipping point in the quality of music writ large. And while I can't say for sure whether Albini is right, there's definitely something to be said for the effect that the overuse of autotune has had on how popular music sounds today. Uh, Jack continues, Love your Star Trek cosmic spiritual theme read into the song. Made me think good and hard. I think of the fade demo and album versions as two unique, very different songs. And I may prefer the demo, not enough to switch it out over the original, the demo being less thematically congruent with the rest of the album, but a matter of my own taste. Those two song versions make for a difference not unlike Climb That Hill Blues versus either of the hard-rocking versions from All The Rest and She's The One slash Angel Dream. Uh, That could be a new Rorschach test for your guests. Which of the three Climb That Hill versions is better? And you know what, Jack? That actually was my initial question. Isn't that wild? Um, I just, I revised it because I thought that the two versions of Walls were slightly more accessible and would be easier for fans to think about, especially in a shorter time frame on a podcast. But, yeah, that's the one I that's the one I picked originally, which is the best of those three. Uh, over on Twitter, Steve Ursel tweeted, great episode. Uh, thanks, Steve. Fascinating insight uh, on the music, and you've made me ponder the lyrics in more depth than I had previously. 
It's ambiguous, but in the end, I suppose it doesn't matter so much exactly what Tom intended. It's what it evokes in the listener that really counts. And I couldn't agree more, Steve. Uh, Good art for me. I've said this before. It's always about resonance and personal interpretation. It shouldn't be overly prescriptive in mind, unless it's something very, very specific, like, you know, the tale of the hurricane, as Bob Dylan put it forward, or something along those lines where it's historical. Um, On Instagram, Lisa Kelly Pennington is now 7-1 in guessing my ratings for this season and says, I like your interpretation, but also just that this song is open to so many interpretations. And Army of Darkness and now a Shawshank reference, right on. So, Lisa, I'll have to turn up my, uh, I'll have to up my pop culture references game, I guess. Um, but you know what? All my references are definitely, they're all going to be from the last millennium for, for the most part. I haven't really kept up with anything since 2000. Well, hello, Mr. Fancy Pants. Um, at Couples Rob commented, Don't Fade On Me is a striking deep cut for me as well. It reeks of the devastating effects mental illness can cause. I've had two close friends that Tom describes to a T. Extremely outgoing, fun, and these guys definitely didn't play by the rules. Each of them suddenly changed, almost overnight, stricken by depression. No clear cause, it just happened. One of them battled their way through it, and he's now doing great. The other one has been lost forever. I can't ever skip over this one when it comes on. So chilling. And again, Rob, I'm very sorry for the loss of your friend, uh, but happy to hear that one of them managed to find their way back through the fog and to some clarity in their life. And that connection to the, the emotion that you feel related to this experience must be challenging sometimes, but hopefully you think more about your friend who got through it Uh, as your anchor point and not the one who didn't. Okay, that's all the social media wrapped up. Thanks to everyone who took time to leave me a note. As always, it's always greatly appreciated. Uh, It's time to get a little more dark and a little more serious again this week by talking about the ninth track from Wildflowers, Hard On Me. So, let's get into it. Before we start to dig into the song proper, I just wanted to comment on something I think I only noticed as I was sitting down to write the script for this episode. When you go through the track listing for Wildflowers, three songs have the word me in the title, and the further three songs have the word you. And I would say that with the exception of You Wreck Me, which is also the one, that, uh, the one of the three that has both words in it, the inflection on you or me is sad rather than happy. And I think that exposes the really personal nature of this album as much as the content of any one song. In the liner notes for Wildflowers and all the rest, uh, it's mentioned that Tom is on record as saying that he and Rick Rubin, the the co-producer, were a little mad that Hard On Me didn't become the big song from the album. In conversations with Tom Petty, Tom confirms this uh, by telling author Paul Zolo, both of us thought that this was going to be the thing that everybody picks up on, but it wasn't. But Rick really loves that song. And for his part, Rubin says this, I don't know what is so special about this song but I don't know any other song that makes me feel like this one does. Maybe the longing in the voice in the song changes has something to do with it. Well, it may not be the song that everyone picks up on, but that's not to say uh, that this isn't a really important song in the development of this album. And I suspect that some of this feeling from both Tom and Rick comes from the fact that this was the very first thing Tom wrote for the album and the first song they recorded. Uh, Ruben comments, This is the first song we recorded for the album. This take is actually Steve Ferroni's tryout to play on the album and the first time Tom, Mike and Ben ever played with Steve in the studio. Tom liked it so much, not only did Steve end up playing on all of the Wildflowers album, he ended up becoming a heartbreaker forevermore. So that freshness and urgency in this song is probably due in large part to the spontaneity of that session with Steve and first playing together as, quote unquote, a band. That sort of connection to a song for the artist can be really powerful. And... This set of circumstances could also explain a slight curiosity about this song that I've always wondered about. Howie Epstein plays bass on only three songs on Wildflowers, or three that made the final 15 anyway that were included on the album. And of the remaining 12, Tom plays bass on three and Mike Campbell on eight, leaving one song that none of the three play on. And this song is the outlier. So why wouldn't Tom or Mike have played on this one? I think the answer comes from a comment that Mike makes in the Wildflowers and all the rest liner notes where he says, It was the first track we cut on the first day in the studio with Rick Rubin producing. It's a very simple song, kind of like a Neil Youngish guitar song, and it didn't need much, but what it needed was just a really solid groove all the way through. It's all just two guitars, bass and drums and vocal, basically telling the story live. So from this, what I suspect is that they played and recorded this in very much the same way they would go on to record the Mojo album, Live Off The Floor. Uh, And if the first take or one of the first takes you get captures the song the best, then you keep it. 
you don't go back and keep trying to improve it. As this was the first song recorded, according to Ruben, his comment uh, that this was Ferroni's audition song supports this idea, I think. Ferroni comes in, nails the vibe, and they think, yeah, that's the take. So, getting back to the bass, if you're going to audition a drummer, it's better to be able to play the song in its entirety rather than having him play along to just a rhythm guitar or a pair of guitars. And to stage left, John Pierce. Pierce uh, is a very well-respected session player and touring musician who has been a member of Huey Lewis and the News since 1995, as well as being the touring bassist with Toto and a former member of San Francisco pop rockers Pablo Cruz. If we go back to 1992, Mick Jagger was recording his solo album Wandering Spirit in LA, uh, most of which featured Pierce on bass. Among the other hired guns for that album were Kurt Biscara, who would have a future connection with the Heartbreakers, as well as Lenny Castro, who plays percussion on this song, and one Ben Montench. So, I suspect that this unfolded in the following way. Hey, we have Steve Ferroni coming in today. We should bring someone in to play bass with us so we can just jam for a while and see if it's a fit. Yeah, that's a good idea. I've been working with John Pierce on that Mick record I've been playing on. I could give him a call. Let's do it. This is pure speculation on my part, of course, but when you have good session players who are available and you have a connection with, it makes life a whole lot easier. And what an introduction to the band for Steve Ferroni. The song starts with that snare flam and those beautifully tuned toms. The main beat is accented by the light touches on the ride cymbal and is complemented by the wonderfully restrained bass part, played by John Pierce. Instrumentally, we get a hard pan separation of the sound with Ben Mont's Hammond organ in the left channel, and I thought it was Mike's, but I'm starting to wonder, actually, I think it might be Tom uh, playing that wonderfully distorted lead guitar line in the right channel. The first verse comes in after the four-bar intro, maintaining that organ lead guitar melodic flow, with Tom's voice sitting in his very gentle, almost falsetto space. Tom tells author Paul Zolo, It was the first song written for the whole album, probably the first thing I did. It's all I can do to keep that little girl smiling and keep my faith alive. That's what I remember. And you can see how this entire song could be built around that one opening line. The second guitar comes into the left channel on the title line, where we also have that key change element that becomes the hook of the entire song. After this first verse, or verse chorus, if you consider the you want to make it hard section of the chorus, more on that later, uh, we drop back into the second verse, which structurally sits in the same space as the first, with no real build to the pattern or the instrumentation. It's very stripped back and very live feeling. Now, there's a nice little triplet that Ferroni plays on the hat right after the line, you were supposed to be, um, but otherwise, it's pretty much the same as the first iteration. I find the lyrics in this second verse, though, really interestingly put together. It's almost like it's a diary entry that isn't specifically written to be a song at all or to have a song structure. If you just read the words, you were supposed to be the friend that I needed when I was down, and now you want to make it hard. That's just one sentence, one complete idea. But Tom finishes one line, when I was down and now, so that you want to make it hard on me can be that title line. You also have that different syllabic count to the first lines of each verse. It's all I can do to keep that little girl smiling versus some other time I'd be understanding. So 13 versus 10 syllables. It almost feels like the lyrics to this one came before the music, which I don't think was Tom's most common way of writing. But when you read all of the verse lyrics, it has that almost self-confessional, semi-cathartic edge to it. Tom's just getting all of this off his chest. I mentioned already that you could consider the repeated title line the chorus of this song, and I think that that's how Tom conceived it. In Paul Zolo's book, Tom tells the author that it has a cool structure too, with two bridges. And we're heading into one of those sections after these two verse or verse chorus pairs. The drums lead us into this section with a fill that starts and ends on the snare with the toms between. We have the organ rising to a higher octave, and the two guitars in the left and right channels trading off little licks between the vocals. We also have a beautiful high harmony overdubbed by Tom, as well as some percussion from Lenny Castro, in the form of a very delicately mixed shaker. And the chord progression in this bridge ends with a very Beatles-esque section that always reminds me strongly of that similar part in Carry That Weight from Abbey Road. So after this first iteration of the bridge, we then get the verse progression, but instrumentally, with the guitars and organ taking turns to lead without necessarily soloing. You couldn't really call it anything a guitar solo in this song. Uh, when the progression gets to the end, Tom sings that title line, which underscores the idea uh, that this is the chorus and this is how Tom intended the song to work structurally. To add to this unusual choice to leave this verse section empty of lyrics, we go back into the bridge section for a second time. There's a very subtle change here too from Steve Ferroni where he goes to double time on the hats, but he's hitting them so gently that you don't really catch it, or I certainly didn't really catch it at first. 
There's also some heavier fills, and these are the crash cymbal that leads us back into that descending progression. The fill coming out of this bridge back into the last verse is utterly sublime and marks a stark contrast between Ferroni and his predecessor uh, in the band Stan Lynch. There's a barely perceptible grace note before the second tom hit with two cymbal hits, ride and crash, that bring us back to the kick on the first beat of the next bar. That's very delicate, very technically precise playing. It's also exactly what the song needs and is again a point where you can see why Tom simply didn't feel that Stan was the right guy to be playing on this set of songs and why Stan probably wasn't looking forward to playing on this set of songs because it's not his style. Either way, the drum part that we get is perfect. Okay, folks, it's time once again for some petty trivia. Your question from the Don't Fade On Me episode was this. Which song, chronologically, is the first in the Heartbreakers catalog to feature a guest musician? Is it A, Hometown Blues, B, Breakdown, C, Magnolia, or D, You Tell Me? Well, in reverse order. Duck Dunn played bass on You Tell Me on side two of Damn the Torpedoes on You're Gonna Get It, Magnolia featured Phil Seymour on backing vocals. Duck Dunn also plays that lazy swinging bass part on Hometown Blues from the day, which is track three from the debut record, which means that the answer is B. The track immediately before Hometown Blues on that record, Breakdown, which features Jeff Girard on electric guitar and Phil Seymour again on backing vocals. Your question for this week is this. Vagabonds, Virgins and Misfits, Mike Campbell and the Dirty Knobs new album was produced by which ex-Heartbreakers producer? Is it A, Jeff Lynn? B, Ryan Ulyate? C, Jimmy Iovine? Or D, George Draculius? <laughs> Okay, back to the song. Uh, the beat picks up subtly in this last verse, keeping that double time on the tightly closed hi-hat, and we're getting a full snare hit instead of the side stick from the previous verses. And if you're not sure what the difference is between side stick and like a full snare, uh, listen to the difference in the drum pattern between the first and last verses. Here's the first verse. And here's the last. There isn't a big build instrumentally in this song toward the end, so there's lots of space for the percussion to provide this movement at the end of the song. After a repetition of the chorus, we then have a nice beefy fill to lead us into the outro, which is just the verse progression with a, a wonderfully alternating left and right channel guitar lick trade-off before the song concludes on the big open minor root chord. Okay, let's talk about the lyrics in this one. Um, is it the most personal, most revealing lyric Tom ever wrote? I, that's to be in the discussion, I think. Um, in his seminal biography, uh, Petty, author Warren Zanes writes, Wildflowers is the most intimate song cycle Petty had yet created, with tracks that felt largely unadorned, no matter the complexity of what went into them as productions. Time to move on, hard on me, only a broken heart, to find a friend, don't fade on me. They were all snapshots in a dark family album. Tom tells the author, I've read that Echo is my divorce album, but Wildflowers is the divorce album. That's me getting ready to leave. I don't even know how conscious I was of it when I was writing it. I don't go into this stuff with elaborate plans, but I'm positive that's what Wildflowers is. It just took me getting up the guts to leave this huge empire that we had built and to walk out. My kids, I knew this was going to be devastating to the whole family. I was leaving them there without me to balance things out. And with his ex-wife Jane in a really bad emotional and psychological state, Tom knew that a lot of the emphasis was falling on him to keep things together at home for the sake of his youngest daughter, Anna Kim. And it's all betrayed in that opening line. It's all I can do to keep that little girl smiling and keep my faith alive. After an opening line that would break the stoniest of hearts, you have the bridge section where Tom is trying to figure out a way to give himself permission to almost acquiesce to his current situation. 
Maybe if I tried, I could turn the other cheek. Maybe, but how big do I have to be? It's really tough to listen to when you have the full context of how Tom's personal life would unravel over the next two or three years. So for more chat about the lyrics here, today's guest conversation sees the return of the brilliantly insightful Nicholas Apostolaris. And who better than a clinical psychologist to bring in to talk about a song that kickstarts a divorce album and cries out for someone to help, to understand, or just simply to be there. So, you know, I de- I'm deep into Echo, right? Echo yeah. kind of floored me when I started listening to Echo. Echo floored me. And, and now uh, Wildflower says floored me only because of, of what happened after Wildflower. We'll talk about this, I hope. Yeah. But um, on, on Echo, I felt like Benmont had to bring his, his energy, his chops to lift up the the team and mike yeah. did it too. mike even did extra producing and, and took the lead on it yeah uh tom petty was in such difficult shape but y- you'll hear um mike and benmont dueling solos they'll be yeah. dueling so it's probably the only couple times that i've heard it where they really where benmont is stepping up as a lead on the uh keyboards on on a, on a recorded track i'm gonna have to go back and see which one that was um, but I think it was, it was going to be off of Echo where Benman, I think, had to step it up. Well, I mean, yeah, like you said, I mean, Echo, when we get to Echo, I'm actually going to tell people quickly on listeners that Nick's going to be coming back on to do a bit of a deep dive into Echo because obviously oh. it's, a, it's a special album for you. And obviously, like you said, I mean, it was I probably think the most difficult time in Tom's life. I mean, barring, I mean, this whole period, right? You know, um, Wildflowers, she's the one echo that's the three that sort of within that period of everything falling apart and so the material that we get out of that obviously is going to be reflective and obviously is going to be difficult and that's why tom didn't play a lot of the stuff from echo because obviously it's going to drag you back into that period in your life that you don't want to maybe remember you know but wildflowers i mean to start in the starting point for wildflowers well this is i mean what an album as a musician i mean as a fan it's one thing that as a musician when you listen to wildflowers any musician you talk to says, yeah, just that sound of the ra- that record is just off the chart. It's incredible. So do you remember when Wildflowers came out? Were you, were you a fan when Wildflowers? I, I seem to recall that we had a chat that you came to Petty a little bit later too. So I came early. Um, I'm a little older than you. So yes, you are. I was a Not much. Mu- <laughs> music person in the late 70s. That's, that was the environment that shaped my uh, aesthetic. Maybe it shaped my, my interests and it got me thinking about what I felt was legitimate or what, what I felt was real. And, yeah. and what I felt was in those days, it would be like, what's a sellout or what is an affectation or whatever, and what is raw and real. Yeah. And unlike most adults, I don't think I really developed very much from those days. So, you know, <laughs> my aesthetic is pretty much 1979 in many ways. <laughs> um, so the early Petty stuff where I saw him kind of taking, a punk sensibility, a rock and roll sensibility, unbelievable senses of melody, harmony, putting it all together, kind of taking it to another level, but keeping it pretty raw. Yeah. Especially when they were, especially when they were producing it early on. Uh, that always was a, was a high point for me, even though it got much more polished, much more refined. Um, with with Ivan and, and and going forward, of course, with Jeff Lynn. Yeah. Now we, I started detaching, probably after Hard Promises a little bit, from from Mr. Petty's uh, music. The other thing that I kind of had a sense for is uh, through my parents, I had sort of a backstage look at the music and entertainment business growing up. Yeah, they were in that field, and I kind of saw the the risks to it or the see me underside to it or the what it could do to people and i sort of had a sense of 
well, he's experimenting in areas that I think might not end up so well for. Right. Right. So the whole psychedelic yeah. thing, it was really creative and it was really, it launched him and it opened his perspectives. And for me, it was like, oh, I'm, I'm, he's, I'm not going there right now. Right. I think, I think it's a rough road for the man and I'm going to just, he's not connecting with me right now. Well, and that's, but that's the thing in music, right? I mean, th there's lots of artists where, I mean, I'm a huge, huge, huge Foo Fighters fan, but the last three albums, yeah, they've not really been my thing. And it's, it, it is that aesthetic. It's, it's, it's the production style, the production choice, and the, the sort of the territory and the subjects that Dave's going into writing about. It's not even so much that I don't think it's good. I just, it just doesn't interest me as much, right? And the same thing with Pet, like if you get into that situation, we think, well, I'll leave it for a little while here. But then do you remember Wildflower was coming out? And did it have an impact yeah. on you immediately? No, it didn't because it was too soft. So right. I would have been with Stan. So <laughs> my sensibilities were more like Stan's sensibilities. Yeah. He would say once, you know, I thought we were going to turn into the animal. <laughs> and we didn't turn into the animals. Yeah. Then, you know, Tom went off on this amazing journey. And Stan, I don't think, was appreciated as a fantastic, uh, you know, live drummer, fantastic energy, lots of stuff. And the visions parted. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I kind of view Tom Petty's solo work as really not so much solo as a way to step away from Stan in, in, in many ways. Those first two albums, yeah, I think it was definitely, there's definitely a part of that for sure. Or certainly stepping away from the, the constraints that Stan puts on what you can do as a band, maybe, is the way to think about it, right? Because, I mean, you think even Into the Great Wide Open, that's that first step towards this new way of working and this new way mm -hmm. of writing that Tom's done. Because I've always talk, talked about this with John Paulson about, to me, that's the, that's the start of the second half to me is Into the Great Wide Open. But that Stan just doesn't fit into that, right? Because like you said, yeah. Stan wants to rock out. Well, Tom wants to write more songs that are, he does want to explore that other side of his songwriting color palette. And Stan just isn't the right guy. And that's fine when that happens in a band, right? It happens all the time in bands where one guy says, you know what, I'm not digging this anymore. I'm going to go do something else. And that's fine. People, I think people build that up too much sometimes to be this great big thing. That's yeah, musicians. Musicians just don't get along musically sometimes. You know, I think that's true. And, and Stan has said that i do think there's this other layer to it yeah where there are these two really big personalities yeah so it wasn't just this you know esoteric musical taste thing that they might have been able to thrash out but they were there was a lot of energy going in two different directions and not it wasn't always happy it well, seemed and, and also Stan and mike and that's, that's the that real problem. Deal. If you're butting heads with the boss, that's one thing. If you're also, if Mike Campbell's not just not talking to you, yeah, that's going to be a bigger problem. So. <laughs> well, apparently, you know, I, I only know what I read and I don't know, you know, you'd ever know the source as well. Yeah. But uh, th there was reason for that as oh, yeah. I read. <laughs> Me too. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, I was definitely on Mike's side on that one. I was like, yeah, I think, I think Mike's right. <laughs> <laughs> I think Mike got a point yeah. there. So... You know, you asked about wildflowers, the whole, the whole thing. No, I wasn't tuned in at the time. And it, it really wasn't until maybe the last seven, eight years where I said, okay, um, there's, this is an American genius here. And the limitations that I'm, that I'm placing on the music are my limitations. Yeah. Right. So now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get myself humble and not come in with it like, what do I like? What do I not like? I'm going to say, this is a great, great artist that I will grow as I learn more and more deeply about what he was doing and what he was trying to do uh, throughout the whole career. So then I went back and I went in my own way, you know, a journey from the beginning and getting yeah. all the material and, and, and listening. And of course, I've got this, we, we have this hindsight. Right. So the thing with, with Wildflowers, for me, just the whole project and the whole time, you know, he has said it's this divorce album, whereas people thought Echo was the divorce album. It's Wildflower yeah. divorce album. And it's a divorce from Stan in some ways. Yeah. All right. That's a relationship that went back as far as with Chain. And that was a very deep relationship in that other side of his life, the music side of his life. 
And it was deep and it was brotherly and conflictual and two bosses with big personalities that didn't take no. And it was very hard to manage it. And just to say, you know, it's not going to be him yeah. was huge. So he takes that leap. If you don't mind me just talking about my overall uh, uh, with, with it. He takes that leap. He's, it's a divorce album, but the divorce doesn't happen for a while, right? And if you just come at the album and you listen to it, and there are these gorgeous songs, they're sonically gorgeous. The lyrics are are rich, and and you want to listen more carefully. Even the nonsense lyrics are fantastic. You yeah. know, even improv lyrics are great. So he's at his peak, right? He's at his peak. But here's the point. I just it, it hit me as I was reflecting on this album. Why I have such deep feelings about it is because. Okay, here he was making this huge life decision in a way in both his musical life and his personal life. He yeah. didn't know it yet. Yeah. He kind of knew it, but it was these songs that was giving voice to his life decision. He had already said no to Stan, but now he's got to talk about what's his, what his life decision. Yeah. And he comes at these. Clearly, his, his family, his, his kids are really important. Um, the song where you wanted me to focus on is was one of the first songs he wrote. Yeah, for this whole project, it was really important song. Uh, Heart of me, even though it's hidden, it's sort of a hidden track. It was really central uh, to to launching the project. But what is so incredibly sad for me, and when I listen to this whole project, it's so poignant. Is okay. So he writes. Wildflowers and people think it's a nice light love song. And really, a little later, he says, You know, I was talking to my therapist and it's about me. Yeah. Okay. It's about me. Well, that's a beautiful song about yourself. But, but Kev, what happened to this man after this? What happened to him is he had a just horrific time in life after this project. Yeah. So, the project, which is so full of love, hope, trying not to be bitter, but understanding what happened to him and how hard it's been, how hard the future is going to be on his kids, but hopeful, yeah. looking forward. And you know what? In the short and medium term, it did not turn out well. Well, I think that that's something that people forget sometimes, that emotionally, when you get freedom, it does come with a price sometimes. And sometimes there is that, downstream effect of the decisions that you've made that while you know that the right they are the right decisions for you and that you need to make them it's going to affect other people and because it affects other people that's going to come and bounce back on back onto you again right and i think that that we forget that sometimes yeah tom found his freedom and he, and he sings about this lots and redemption and, and all those types of things on this album but like i said the downstream effect of that is people are going to get hurt and people did get hurt and i think that's then what pushes him further down into that pit that he ends up in in echo right so because he's a very sensitive guy and he's, he's got that like you said he's he's a tough and he's a leader in the band but whenever you read about him you know and dana talks about him he wasn't that way in his personal life a lot of the time he was very quiet and very unassuming and didn't like you know he didn't like to do interviews and he didn't he didn't like all that stuff he didn't like the limelight he loved the songs and the craft so having that sort of push back down into become this very sensitive guy now under all this pressure then you can see absolutely where echo comes from so here are these songs. You know, it's amazing that there were two out double album mirror or, yeah. or a whole set of releases because the depth of the songs, uh, the depth of the catalog had be built just from this this series of recordings was amazing. Um but you you get both his respect and love for women. Yeah. In some ways his powerlessness. His hopefulness about, you know, things can be okay, very American. Things are going to be okay. They're going to work out. Things are going to be, they're going to work yep. out in the end. But the forces that get unleashed with this are almost superhuman. They're, they're, they're almost beyond normal. Yeah. So he winds up not, not having the acclaim from this work of genius. He's in the chicken shack. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> He's not shaking shot. Not, not living his best life. Right from, his, from his kids. Yeah. Right? So he's writing this. I, I, and you might know more of this about this song than, 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 than me, but 
it feels like he's writing to, to Anakin. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think there's a there's an undercurrent of that. I think it's probably to both of his kids, but more because Anakin obviously was the younger of the two and probably impacted by that in, in, in a different a way than Adrian would have been, right? So because I think Adrian real- was. Yeah, I think Adrian was 20 or 21 yeah. at this point, right? I think. I think something like I think about 20. So she would have been not easy to deal with, but at least sort of have that that emotional mat- maturity to understand that this is two people, not just mum and dad. But Anakin's, what, four years younger? So no, I think so. I don't have it in front of me. I believe Adrian was Adrian was 21, and I think Anakin was 14 at this time. Was 47. So yeah, that's... That's so. a tough place. My, my mom and dad divorced when I was 10. And I didn't realize how much that impacted me until a lot later in life. Right. So I, I didn't get that. I didn't know how much that impacted me. Um, but of course yeah. it did. Of course it's going to, right? When your family gets up, the upheaval of that is, is significant. Absolutely. Absolutely. And he saw it in front of him because Anakin had trouble. And I think she went to live, she was with him for just a little bit and then went to live with her sister. Yeah. So it was right. Things happened in front of him. And like, this is right before that. You know, it's all I can do to keep that little girl smile. Okay. Yeah. He always says, and, and Adrian said this, he says it's not autobiographical or he says it's allegorical, but there's yeah. so, much autobi- auto, so much autobiography in there. So yeah. she called, his daughter called him out on it. Like, no, 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 <laughs> look at that lyric. Look at that lyric. <laughs> so yes, it's all allegorical and he's magical and mysterious in how he puts the lyrics together. And it's not always sequential. It's not always one narrative in a song. Yeah. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's just there for you. Yeah. So he's worried about what is with this difficult marriage with this yeah. also brilliant woman, Jane, you know, brilliant, dynamic woman, uh, had a lot going for her. I think she gets forgotten about potentially. The, the Harrisons seem to really like her a lot. Yeah. I mean, she had Stevie her own Nicks was a fa- Stevie Nicks was a good friend of Jane's and yeah. Stevie Nicks. Right. So someone who brought a lot big personality yeah. also a lot of challenges difficult to leave yeah yeah so he sees it but he's optimistic and then you know what it didn't work out that way. yeah it really it's, didn't it's interesting like you said because this with this being one of the first songs that was written for the album it's interesting that it's probably the only song that made the cut at least that does have that bitterness in it because that that sort of element of breakup and separation, there's always going to be that bitterness there at some level. You can choose to write about it or express it or not in different ways. But the rest of the album is more focused on the hopeful side and the redemption. All those are, those elements come through a bit more strongly. But with this one, it's it's pretty direct. Like you said, I mean, to say that this is not autobiographical is insane. And like you said, I mean, Adria said lots that. When she heard this album, she knew that her parents were done. Yes. You've got to think that this is one of the songs where she thinks, oh, shit. I mean, mom and dad, are, that, this is a dad singing about mom. You know, some of the time I'd be understanding you were supposed to be the friend that I needed when I was down, and now you want to make it hard. I mean, that's, it's pretty direct. You know? Although I think in general, and I keep coming back to it because I want, I, I'm not just gushing about everything. I'm, I'm, it, it hurts me to listen to this. Yeah. He remains. To me, it's more like he's hurt, he's frustrated. How? It's like, how? How big do I have to be? Yeah. How can I keep this little girl smiling? He doesn't have the answer. He knows these are big questions. He doesn't have answers. Yeah. But he's not dumping. He's not dumping. He's not vilifying and he's not uh, demeaning. He's just saying, this is big. I've got my little girl or girls. I don't know how this is going to work out. It's clearly going to be hard. Yeah. I'm not going to be the man that I want to be. How big do I have to be? Yeah. To not say something back. How big do I have to be to just take it, turn the other cheek? Yeah. And he's like, dude, I'm, I'm just a guy. You know, <laughs> how yeah. big do I have to be? I can't do it. We think about the number of, I mean, both men and women in relationships who stay for the kids, you know, and it's sometimes it's really not a good idea. Like I said, I mean, when my mom and dad separated, I was, it really, you know, threw me off kilter for a lot of years. But looking back, those two people, those two adults couldn't, now that I know them as adults, now that I'm an adult myself and I'm married, and I've been through life experience. They couldn't be together. They were wrong for each other, 
God only knows how they ever got together in the first place. You know what I mean? So it, it is that difficult thing of, and that kicker line, but how big do I have to be? Do I stay? Do I just, am I supposed to just suffer through life just to make sure that other people are okay? Because that's just, like I said, that's a road to madness. And I don't think Tom would have lasted had that continued. I don't think he would have made it out of it. Hmm. Kev, thanks for, for bringing that up. I do have firsthand experience with that too. Um, so this, you know, kind of focusing on this song and on this album, you know, for me, I can't really get to the, it's hard for me to get beyond what this meant to that family yeah, and to Tom Petty in terms of his life and what happens later. Um, but even through this, which is like, there's fear, there's hope, there's recognition that something big is happening and there's freedom all in this set. Yeah. Freedom. And, you know, there's some freedom from that brilliant Stan, who obviously I adore Stan. But now now Tom is free, really free, to be himself as the headliner. Yeah. And to bring in it, the loves of his musical life. You know, who's right there? Mike. Yeah. Mike. Mike is right there. Interesting. You know, there are two, there are two versions. A part of me, you know this, obviously. There's an alternate take. And the alternate take features Mike on, on slide. Yeah. And it's a great line. I mean, he does a great job. Mike. Right? <laughs> it's Mike. Mike on slide is like, <laughs> one, it's probably what, the best since whenever, since 1980 or whatever. Yeah. Um, but what was chosen was this. Yeah. The strip down. I know Mike plays on it because I look. Because this yeah. could be this could be Tom playing solo. He you know he has a certain repertoire of, of what he can do. Yeah, on guitar. Like he was asked, you know, how do you? Somebody asked him, how do you tell what's your part and what's Mike's part? And he said, oh, Mike's got the heart. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, and it's funny because you can once you get into once you really get into Petty and once you really listen to Mike, you can tell you can tell who's playing. Oh, more. Yeah. I mean, there's a few instances where you think, hang on, that well. I could, well, I'm not too sure on that, but it's it's very few instances because usually it's, you know, you can just tell it's Mike Campbell because Mike Campbell plays a very certain way and Tom Petty plays a very certain way as well, you know. Uh, not to underestimate Tom Petty's guitarist because he's a fantastic guitarist in his own right. So Yes. Yeah, and he underestimated himself and and and, and Mike nudged him sometimes, take that lead, take that yeah. lead. You've yeah. got it. Um, getting back to to just this song, so this is like a keystone for me. He he did it straight. There's not a lot of allegory in it. It's yeah. pretty straightforward. And what did he do? He he chose the stripped down version where it could be just him and a guitar. You know, it could be just yeah. one guitar. Uh, and he could do those parts. So this is not Mike adding uh, his beautiful lyrical counter. I see Mike as like a counter vocalist. He's yeah. another vocalist with his guitar. He has his own melody line through how he how he plays. Um, well, he didn't do it. So it was like Tom was like, no, no, no. This is the straight dope right here. Yeah. And putting it in ninth spot, I think, right? It's track nine on the album if you're on CD. And I think it, is it open side C or maybe? But that kind of almost not burying it, so, but keeping it further down it's not one of the first because you know if it's for the first song and it sort of is one of the big premises of the album is that like i said it's that keystone put it up front you could understand why you would do that but really sonically you can't do it because you have to open this song with wildflowers you sort of have to you don't know how it feels sort of has to be tracked too which the other thing about this album that we don't talk about enough i think sometimes is the sequencing of it is extraordinary because i was talking about it so i just did that you know you wreck me came out today as we're recording yeah. Yeah, so you start wildflowers good. is the oh giving myself permission to be free. You don't know what it feels is that call to empathy. You know, don't you don't understand people's situation. Time to move on is sort of that acceptance. And then what does he do? You wreck me. We get this big bold fifties slash sixties rock and roll song just to say, okay, don't worry, I'm not taking you too far down this morose you know, this pathway or this very serious pathway. Maybe is a better word. I'm going to give you something to tap your foot to. And so putting Hard On Me down at nine, I think it sort of gives you that, you that pathos right in the middle of the journey. How about it after Don't Fade On Me? Oh, 
Whoa, I'm alive. I'm alive. Whoa, whoa. You know, knockout punches yeah. there. Uh, and, but then right right in between, right in between uh, Only Broken Heart and Don't Bet On Me is Honeybee. <laughs> yeah. Just again, just to keep it, well, we're not, not going to, it's keep it a little bit. And the same with Cabin Down Below. It gives you a bit more of a lift again after Hard yeah. On Me because, you know, Don't Fade On Me and Hard On Me, like you said, is a one-two punch of some serious weight and imports, right? So, Well said, well said. Uh, and, and only the king of Pomona could pull that off, right? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about nonsense lines that really work. <laughs> king of Pomona. So that's the thing. This guy's funny. I forget who said it. Oh, Jason Isbell said it. He said, you know, he could make you cry and he can make you laugh. And I'll tell you, it's harder to make somebody laugh in a song. Yeah. Well, that's why they say that great comedy is harder to write than great drama. Right? It just is. That's just true. It's, it's harder to find what's really, truly funny than what's... Because all you have to do is, like, you know, if you want to put someone in a bad situation, put a kid in a bad situation in a movie... You've got people in the palm of your hand. It's, it's easy to do drama. Comedy's a lot harder. Yeah, and Honeybee makes me laugh. But the, the thing that he'll do once in a while, I'm, I'm getting off track on Hard On Me, but that, that couplet, uh, it's like nauseous adrenaline. Like oh, nauseous. man. It, like, like nauseous what? Adrenaline. Yeah. What? And that's, that's uh, time to move on. So yeah. you got time to move on, which is just, to me, just gorgeous, gorgeous, uplifting. Um, I, I play that for my kids when I want to wake them up. I go into their room, I play that and sing that for them. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. Uh, I usually don't get to that line, though. I was just but I mean, that'll make you laugh. It'll make you startle. It, it'll say, oh, but it's real because yeah. it's a feeling. It's not a joke. No, it, it's that line when you think about that, not in your stomach of anxiety or, or anticipation, whatever it might be. It's not, I've never heard it described better than that. Nauseous adrenaline. And like, you know, Mike Campbell said, like, how do you get that line into a song? Anyone yeah. who could put that line into a song is just a genius. You know? It's a genius. Yeah. He's just a but genius. He, but he throws them away. Like, he just, it's, it's, they're peppered throughout the catalog and throughout the discography. And I've, I think we talked about it last time we chatted that going through this catalog in the way that I've been doing, yeah, almost every song, there's at least one line where I've gone, wow. That, yeah. That's just, that, it's, there's one line every song that you think, man, I wish I'd written that. Oh, yeah. And I know I couldn't. <laughs> so... Yeah, I mean, like when we talked about how big do I have to be, and he, and he, yeah. and he the right thing right there, the course. I mean, it's like that's stop, full stop. That says it. What? Yeah. Here I am. I'm a limited guy. Yeah, I'm a big star. Yeah, I'm still the kid who was beaten by his dad. I'm still that broken kid, and now I'm supposed to transcend being. Somebody being really hard on me now, yeah, and maybe being unfair to me now, and maybe hearkening me back to a very bad time now. How big do I have to be to transcend me? Yeah, and be who I want to be. I can't quite do it. Is how I read that, and it just like hit me all at once. When it's it, the word maybe as well, though, right? Because it's it's that there's that doubt in that word. Maybe maybe if I tried, I could turn the other cheek. Maybe maybe. But how big do I have to be? Like, there's, there's still that. We, he's not resolved in this song yet that he, that he definitely has to leave. It's like, well, do I, like, how big do I have to be? But maybe do I stay? I, you know, I don't know yet. And like I said, it makes sense that this is the start of the album, the start of that process and that catharsis. That he's still in that place where he's unsure. You know, there's a song and we never really talked about it. I don't think. And uh, between two worlds. Yeah. And I, I, that, that's kind of a forgotten song in some ways. And, and to me, he's exploring there this traveling between two worlds of, because I think of him as a feminist. You know, I think of him yeah. as being very respectful to women. Uh, I think of him as, as seeing that uh, sort of toxic masculinity as funny and showing men as small. Yeah. And confident in how he respects women is how I have heard him. And then with Between Two Worlds, I know we're off topic, but with Between Two Worlds, there's a tension there between how he sees women at, normally and how he, how he feels he should. And then there's this very visceral uh, sort of, you know, 
sexualized, objectified almost way that he's, you know, I know, uh, I know a woman's body is only, only flesh involved, right? Yeah. 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 That's the but, last, the last. Yeah. That, that's the core. Is that the course? Of the last, no, it's the, it's the course. Yeah. I know a woman's body is only flesh and bone. How come I can't let go? I'm between two worlds. Between yeah. two worlds. So he's got this idealized world of what he thinks he should be. And then there's the real world. And, yeah. and that, I made that link with this song too, that he's setting himself up as an idealized. I should be able to be big enough to take this. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's a really good point, actually. I'd never, I'd never made that through line specifically. That's a really good point. Because idealism, you know, we're both very, I think, I like to think we're both very progressive thinkers and we're both small L liberal in our, in, yeah, in our yeah. mindsets in a lot of ways. Idealism's hard sometimes because sometimes there are practical limitations to idealism, right? So, yeah. I, 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 you know, when I'd work with folks that were in, in tough shape, um, a lot of times they're very hard on themselves. I, I, I've yeah. been, a, I'm a clinical psychologist and I've worked with a lot of people in tough shape. And I say to them, you might appreciate this. I say, you know, you're just a bloke like me. <laughs> yeah. Just a bloke like me. It's like, why, why are you setting yourself up to be perfect? Yeah. We're just imperfect creatures trying yeah. to make our way through. You know, let's try to get a little bit better. Uh, all of us. Uh, sometimes I think Tom had really high expectations for himself that set himself up for a lot of pain. Well, do you think part of that is just the mechanics of being, it's Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. It's not the Heartbreakers. His name's front and center. He is the band leader. Not only does he, is he the creative force behind this band, but he's also now the figurehead for a business. So it's, it's, it's not just the five guys in the band. There's, a, there's all the roadies and the techs and the, the bookers and the PR people, there's a big machine behind him that he's responsible for. Yeah. So while, and he's the figurehead in his family, that's kind of, so when you combine those things, like I said earlier, that's a lot of pressure. Pressure is a real, not a good thing for human beings all the times. If it's not, if there's no vent for that to come out, right? So. I, I hear that. I hear that kid for, for a few years. I, I was um, a CEO of a not-for-profit, a couple yeah. of not-for-profits. And um, there's a certain responsibility to do things that you have to do because that's you're trying to make your thing that you believe in and that does good things. You're trying to make it survive and grow. Um, but the, you have to do it yourself. You have to um, have those difficult conversations. You have to let somebody go. Yeah. For the good of, of what you're trying to do. Some people call that being the boss. He was clearly the boss. And, and he was clearly able to make those difficult decisions, although he sometimes dragged them out. He sometimes yeah. dragged them out and, and it hurt. Um, the weight of that, I think it couldn't help but affect him. Um, what comes back to, to what you've talked about lots already, what we've talked about lots already is that you know, with the pressure of marriage and the pressure of all that kind of stuff, well, at least the band and the creative element of my life is my safe place. If that release valve gets taken away because one member of that band is now creating tension and pressure within the band as well, now you're at cracking point, right? Now something, now something does have to give. And I think that's the, like you said, that's the drive behind, Stan's got to go, man. Like I can't have, I need some place where I, I need some place to feel free, right? Stan had, Stan had to go and I just, Again, that fella should it be should be a movie about that guy. Yeah, you know? no kidding. I know he's doing speaker words and everything, and he's done great in his life. But, but he, his perspective, and he had a perspective on on top because he saw Tom Petty's um, focus, and that he would focus on on the success. He was a boss. Yeah. He, driving this enterprise towards success when he had to be so he also deconstructed it like i'm not going to sell out yeah. and i'm not going to rip you know take every dollar from it but hell yeah I, heck yeah i want to i want to hear my song on the radio yeah i i want people to enjoy my music i want people to dance to my music i don't yeah. want doing this just for basement tapes i'm doing this to be out there we're going to be the best yeah but he was that boss too 
So when things start going off the rails, personally, in some ways, musically, she's the one didn't yeah. work out musically. He didn't like the vision, d- didn't work out. And then in terms of the band, now, not just the intranessine fighting of the band, but the product wasn't good. Right. After Wildflowers. He didn't even think Echo was good. And that's a whole other story because that's just yeah. jam. That's brilliant. But, you know, he got suckered into doing a soundtrack and then the movie doesn't come out and then this and that. So it all starts falling apart. So there might have been a good reason for optimism as he's writing these songs. Yeah. There's hurt and there's optimism. But I have trouble getting past seeing this as almost a prelude to disaster. The calm before the storm, almost. But there's not just a little storm that you ride out and you enjoy the sound <laughs> of the thunder. He almost died. Yeah. He almost died. Yeah. And, and, you know, up through the recording of Echo, he could have died. And it wasn't until the tour. And then somebody did die with Howie. I mean, what you said, there's no such thing as getting off topic on this podcast, first and foremost, Nick, though, because, you know, I mean, you've listened to this podcast. I just go wherever yeah. the conversation goes. But, you know, thank goodness for Dana Petty, first and foremost, that she was a strong enough person to get Tom through that. But it does show, like you said, you get the chicken shack and you get the, you get the heroin and we get that, that whole situation around, around that period of his life. And this set of songs that I think Echo is extraordinary. It's not, not only is it not a, not a good album, I think it's a phenomenal album. But it's that thing that, you know, people sometimes forget the superstars, we want to use that awful word, I think, you know, or artists are, who fine tune to that level, they are just people, you know, and how big do I have to be? That's, that's a human response. And when so much pressure is applied and you just don't see a way out, even Tom Petty, even someone who does have those morals and does strive to be, you know, if pure is not the right word, but, you know, moral and, and ethical and those kinds of things, that cracking point is still going to come for everyone. I think that, that, so it's a good lesson for everyone to learn that, like you said, if someone's coming in and saying, I've got all this pressure, I'm like, you're just a, you're just a man, you're just a woman, you're just a person, don't, there's, there's the expectation that you put on yourself isn't what everyone else is putting on you. That's, that's an intrinsic thing, not an extrinsic thing, you know? Treat yourself as well as you would treat a stranger. There you go. There's a good credo. Right? <laughs> yeah. And, 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 you know, his father, and I'm not, getting all psychoanalytic on this he said it this is not anything other than he's he really tried to do work in figuring out what did his relationship with his father do to him how could he get through that yeah um how could he survive it how could he be a person he wanted to be with with what he went through uh not just as a young kid but even as an adult the relationship with his father was very fraught yeah um they didn't really reconcile probably until the last sentence that his father said to him or as, you know, yeah. as he was passing. So that's not something you just read a book and forget about. That, that is deep, deep in your DNA. Yeah. Really. But it is deep in, in how you look at life. And uh, it, I think we, we, we can be too... Um, we, someone gets to be the superstar. Someone gets to be successful. And we immediately get into the envious, what does he have to complain about? Yeah. That guy, yeah, I knew him back when, whatever, whatever. And we do yeah. that. This guy was carrying around pain that came out in, in like every other song that he wrote. Again, you don't know how it feels to be me. You don't know how it feels to be me. And that's not, great. again, that's it's great. not an arrogant statement. It's just, like I said, I came to that when I wrote that episode, that, that idea that it's a call for empathy all of us, no one knows what's going on inside someone else's head. I mean, you, you tend to find out because you t- sit and talk to people and it's part of what you do as a, as a professional is you do unpick those knots and you do get to the bottom of some of those things. But most of us, we have no concept of why, you know, it's, it's like I always tell my kids, someone cuts you off in traffic. Yeah. They might just be, they might be having the worst day they've ever had. You know, that day when you were in the bathroom crying, I had to come in and sort of, you know, hug you and tell you everything's going to be okay. Yeah. They might be having that day. So let's just all back up. And I, you know, we say these things to our kids and we try and we try and sort of coach our kids through life. And then we don't apply it to our own lives. And we still, we still do the same thing. But it, when we step back and when we have that reflection, I think that's one of the things that Wildflowers does for me is it's that mirror against 
all the things that Tom's singing about, we're all sort of experiencing and going through in, in sort of little microcosms all our life. It's all there. It's all there in this, in this set of 15 songs and the extra songs that didn't make the album, which are incredible as well. Yes. Um, and so it's, the, it's, it's, almost like a, it's almost like a blueprint for, okay, what's the, what's the tool set that I need to move on and get through this, this sort of fracture from Stan, this, uh, this breakdown with Jane. This is, this is now my toolkit to be able to sort of at least know where my anchor points are, even though they might get lost. So you've got these stars, and I like the word fracture, because in a way, he's just breaking things. This is, you say, okay, what come up till now got me to here? It's got to change. Yeah. Got to change. Who knows, you know, who knows all of the main characters, but you've got Jane as a main character here. You've yeah. got the daughters are our, our, our main characters. Uh, you've got him talking to himself. So his future self is, in a way, a main character. What he hopes for, what he hopes to become, yeah, it is is a character throughout. And I think his father's a main character. Um, you know, I I think about Southern Act and, and his mother's a character, right? Of course, yeah. I mean, that's just a killer. That's that that'll just make anybody cry. Oh. Um, because the tenderness. He respected her, loved her, somehow idealized her, recognized her strength. And then how did he treat women? Pretty darn good for yeah. a man with power in the 70s and 80s and 90s. Absolutely. Like, about as good as it comes, right? Yeah. So that's a touching, poignant relationship that he's eulogizing in that song. And so it comes out and we cry. But here, in some ways, he's breaking... He's got to break the frame with his father too. Yeah. That's not going to be pretty. And that's not going to make people, you know, cry tears of, 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 of deep emotion. That's going to be angry. Yeah. It's going to be busted up and it's not going to get resolved. Yeah. So it's all broken here. It gets all broken. Stan, you know, Stan's tall. I don't know how tall he is, but he's a tall guy. He's, he's six probably four six. or something, isn't he? Yeah. He's, yeah. he's yeah. a big lad. Yeah. He's a big guy. Right? Tom's a sort of a smaller guy. Yeah. So why do I even say that? Because they, they, to me, look like a pair, like an older brother, younger brother pair. Um, you don't know what other, what, what else went into that. Dan's gone. Yeah. Current situation's broken. He's saying it's gone, but not saying it's gone. Um, Jane had difficulties. Now, I don't know, but Adris said it, right? That she was yeah. mean. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, what? I mean, she had her own Problems. issues that also didn't get didn't get addressed, and no one sort of. And I, again, I mean, it's that thing of is it your place? Like Olivia Harrison, you know, like I said, she she was friends with. And, well, is it my place to sort of intervene and do something here? Because you know, we've all again, we've all had friends who go through tough times. You don't know what that yeah. lies. You don't know. Do I? Do I try and inject myself into this situation? Do I say something? Is that gonna? Just push them away. Like, how do I handle this? It's really difficult. Those interpersonal relationships, especially with someone who's struggling, very, very hard, right? So there is no. I think it's that thing of we we want. Well, what's the right answer? Well, sorry, but I, there is not, not. There's not necessarily a right answer in all cases. Sometimes you just got to be there and play things out. So you know, you're used to talking to people. You, you're, you know, Tom Petty. Imagine you were in that situation. And really, it's the great, by that time, it's the great Tom Petty. Yeah. Yeah. Who, other than maybe Stevie, who was, I think, a, a hero a hero also in these in these stories. I think she is a true friend. Yeah. Um, and she tried. But who could have helped him forward? Who could interject? Yeah. And say, no, 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 to the great man. It's very hard to do. So, again, I see all this as a, prelude to that incredibly difficult time that he only emerges you know it's only really getting out of it in the i guess in the i don't know last dj era or something yeah to early 2000s ish kind of that yeah, sort of early run, 2000s yeah. Yeah. and then that's his mature self that has been through the fire it yeah. is somehow survived he's got a new love of his life because yeah. I, th I say new love of his life because he really did love Jane. This of was course, not, yeah, of course, yeah, 
Oprah. I don't know. It's just, I've read a lot. I've heard interviews. I've heard different people. That was a true love there. Well, I think that, that was, real ahead. pain, real pain for real pain to exist, you'd need to have real love, right? Because if, if, if there was no love and he didn't care about her, then it wouldn't have hurt. Leaving her would have been easy. You know, apart from the kids, that, that's the difficult part, but that would have been easy. But clearly he did feel responsibility and he did feel that helplessness that he couldn't help her. I think I've read, you know, parts of him saying, talking about that a little bit, that he just didn't know what to do. So there's that, there's also that feeling of helplessness. If you are the great Tom Petty and yet yeah. you can't fix your own life. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's all, it's all human beings. We're all the pink squishy bits behind the keyboard are the problem with, you know, everything, everything in the world, big and small is we're just fallible, messy, irrational. <laughs> prone to fits of illogic, you know, so, but because of that, we're also capable of creating great works of art. And thank goodness for that. Cause you wouldn't trade one for the other, would you? I don't know. We had the same conversation where that, that point came up and you, and okay. we disagreed. Oh, and did we? we? Okay. <laughs> we did. It was about uh, refugee. Okay. And refugee took 80 takes, right? Yeah. And Mike had to leave the studio. And Stan got beaten up, you know, verbally yeah. Yeah. And, and berated. And uh, Ivy became rich and successful. And those men were hurt, were hurt by that. Yeah. For sure. Yes, you have a piece of work. But you know what? I hear Refugee play live. Mike doesn't even play it that way. Mike plays, he comes in in a different beat. <laughs> it's solo. Yeah. It's like there's one perfect thing. No, Mike plays no. Play it. So Refugee, yeah. Refugee. So yeah. was it worth? My answer is no, but you know, yeah. I never, you've heard my music. I've never made anything that's going to go into the Smithsonian and I never <laughs> will. Nothing, none of my music's going out into orbit on, on pioneer one. Yeah, but, it, but it is what it is like. And I think there was that perfectionism. Yeah. And, and I'm coming maybe from a punk sensibility. I'm coming from a seventies raw sensibility. Yeah. Give me one take vocal. You do this thing with four guys and you put the right miking on it and you give me one take and I'll take that. Yeah. Well, because that that captures that moment. Yes. And there is something beautiful about that. It's like The, the Who, Babo O'Reilly is one of my favorite yes. songs of all time. And I know that's a bit cliche because it's everyone says that. But what I love about that song, that the main the reason why it's one of my favorite songs of all time is because Keith Moon comes in about 10 beats per minute too fast. Where he comes in like a freight train and you can hear him slow down and they left that in. They could have done the take again. Yeah, they could have, but it's like, no, Pete Tens at Townsend, to my mind, is like, no, leave that. That's that's what we sound like. Keith Moon's not a perfect drummer. He's yeah. certainly not a perfect timekeeper. He's one of the greatest of all time, but he's not a great timekeeper. Let's leave it in because that's character. Now, with Wildflowers, it's the opposite end. Again, it's kind of almost more like the Ayurvine thing where they labored over these songs. Heart don't um don't fade on me was I think I read like 50, 60 takes as well, because they just couldn't quite get the exact feel that they wanted. So it's and not that one part. way is right and one way isn't. It's just that sometimes you need to do that this way. And sometimes it does come quickly. Like you reckon me sounds like it was done in an afternoon. I'm sure it wasn't, but it sounds like the way, right? Because it sounds organic and it sounds natural. Yes. So I do come down on sometimes the art can damage somebody a little too much yeah well and you look at you know all the people who've you know janice joplin kurt cobain like any any of the the greats who've gone amy winers all the greats who've gone too early who didn't have that release valve where the pressure just did push them down too far and they couldn't get back up um it happens time and time and time again it's just that it happens in the public eye because that happens to private individuals all the time too we just don't see and hear about that right you know he was in therapy i think uh, through wildflowers so he was coming to some recognition of what he had to start working on yeah if we assume that he was right when he said he was the writer of it right so of course he's right you know tom petty was right when he said that eventually it came, he came to recognize that wildflowers was written about himself right now when yeah. i first heard it i didn't hear that at all i i heard it as a as sort of a beautiful and i actually did a version of it dedicated to my daughter uh i didn't get that but if we do get that and we say he's right he's starting a process he's starting a process yeah. where now he's saying okay i have enough worth yeah i have enough worth 
that I am going to survive this. Yeah. And there's going to maybe be casualties, but yeah. I'm going to survive this. And maybe to my mind, that's, I know Wildflowers is just a gorgeous song, but that statement of I'm worth surviving. Yeah. Well, look, le learning to love yourself and learning to be comfortable with who you are is, again, it takes people different amounts of time. Some people never get there. Some people, you meet those people who are very centered and just have their lives together. And you know that they do have a sense of self, a very strong sense of self and, and value. And then most of the rest of us were somewhere in the middle. And it's like, I think I was probably in my early thirties before I really became comfortable with who I was and okay with where my life was set in and who I was and what my relationships were. That took me, a, took me, a, it took me a step, it took me a few minutes to get there. You know, um, you know, the reconciliation with his dad, when his dad was dying, if I remember the story, right. Was his dad said, you know, I didn't think your music was anything. Yeah. So that's the reconciliation. No, it was nothing. Clearly I was wrong. <laughs> I never thought it was anything, uh, you know, and oh, by the way, yeah, I love you. And, and then yeah. I was like, well, that could have come a lot earlier. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so when you, when you have that background of your father being like not very supportive of you and really wanting you to be something different, not accepting of who you are. Yeah. His father didn't like him with long hair. His father yeah. wanted him to be mainstream. He wanted, wanted him to be, you know, and then who do I see in Wildflowers that's maybe the person also who wasn't what people wanted to be, but played the role was Harry Green. Oh, well, let, I mean, look, when I talk about that, maybe I'll get you back on to talk about that one, because that's something to unpack, that song. Uh, that. Holy moly. Now, that's a deep, I mean, I've got my theories on Harry Green, and I'm, yeah. I'd am be curious to see what yours are, but yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't a shallow songwriter in, in any way. I mean, you know, interpersonal relationships, feminism, culture, any, any, any topic, any big weights topic you want to pick, Tom Petty thought about those things. And if he was going to say something about it, he thought about it before and then he meant what he said. And he was very right. articulate and careful with it. Uneducated. So he didn't do well at school? Yep. At all. He yeah. didn't, in, uneducated in a traditional way. Yeah. He was self-educated uh, and, and a genius. Yeah. So, I mean, this is, you know, I know I'm American. My, I've been American for a generation. <laughs> but this is, to me, such an American story. Even how he educated himself with popular culture, radio and TV. He wasn't reading, sh uh, you know, Sartre. He, yeah, yeah. The, you know, it wasn't reading Dostoevsky. He was watching Gilligan's Island, and he was taking lines from the comedy shows and yeah. listening to what was on the radio. I'm reading so, Mark Twain and Kerouac and, and the great American writers, right? So, yeah. Right, so Which this, everyone should do. Yes. So, to me, you know, here you've got the first song chronologically, Hard on Me, the most honest song or one of the most honest songs in, 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 in the collection, the least allegorical. Yeah. My mind, you know, it is what it is. It's almost hidden. Because he was shy about saying things that were straight. Yeah. Difficult. Difficult so to bury yourself like that. Yeah. What is it? Number nine, you said. Number, it's number nine, yeah. It's buried. That's the worst location on an album, right? Number nine. <laughs> I was like, we got this, we got that, we got that. No, here's some truth. I'm going to shove that in on number nine. Yeah. Right? That's the real deal. So that's how, that's first. But then what he shows up in the collection as number one is, I'm breaking the frame. I'm worth finding a way to live in this world. And here we go. And the poignancy for me is that it, it just was so much harder than I would have hoped it would have been for him. Okay, Pettyheads, that's it for this week. Hard On Me is a difficult song to absorb because of how much it exposes of Tom's life at the time. It's a stunning, stark admission of uncertainty and bitterness, and the version that is included on the album takes the song down to its bare bones. Engineer Jim Scott comments on this in the Wildflowers and All the Rest liner notes, saying, Most of Wildflowers is super delicate and bone dry. No reverb, no delay, 
no cushion. And because of this production design, you can hear the hurt very clearly in Tom's voice. I think their slightly peculiar arrangement with that super short chorus and their repetition of the bridge, either side of an instrumental passage through the verse, gives the entire track a haunting beauty. And of course, as a drummer, Steve Ferroni's first drum part on a Tom Petty song is a real standout for me. So the question is, can I put this song at the very top table of Tom's compositions? Does it stand up to songs like Room at the Top, The Waiting, or Learning to Fly? I'm going to say no, um, but it's not very short. It's not very far back of that. Um, All in all, I think a rock-solid 8 out of 10 is the right score for this song, but I look forward to finding out why I'm wrong about that. The Tom Petty Project is a proud member of the Deep Dive Podcast Network. Go check us out on Twitter at Deep Dive Podnet. I'm sure you'll find something there that you like. You can also check out my other podcast, Seaside Pod Review, a Queen podcast that I do with my very best friend, Randy Woods, who performs all the music you hear in this podcast. Also check out the Ultimate Catalog Clash that I co-host with the one and only Corey Morissette. Uh, We're almost getting toward the end now of the third season, which covers the first 20 years of Foo Fighters. Um, It's been a blast. I've introduced Corey to some songs he's never heard before. And if you're into Foo Fighters at all, check it out. Um, There's quite a lot of swearing in that show, though. So if you're not used to that, eh, maybe give it a swerve. Uh, Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, and YouTube at The Tom Petty Project and on Twitter at Tom Petty Project. Go follow, like, subscribe as applicable, and give a rating if you haven't already done that. Keep talking to me on social media, and I'll keep reading out your comments on the show. Uh, As a weekly reminder, The Tom Petty Project is not affiliated with The Tom Petty Estate in any way, and when you're looking for Tom's music, please visit official streaming platforms or go to your local independent record seller, folks. Go get some physical media. Um, If you're looking for official merchandise, go to TomPetty.com. And if you're looking for merch for this show, please go to TomPettyProject.com. Don't forget to check out the Tom Petty Nation and Tom Petty Fans Forever groups on Facebook. If you're not already a member, they are excellent groups. And also do check out Tom Petty Radio, which is channel 31 on Sirius XM. Until we meet again next week, keep listening to and sharing Tom's music. Try to be kind. Try to say I love you to someone at least once a day. Stay safe and healthy, and I'll be back with you next week to talk about track 10 from Wildflowers, the sleazy, stanky, riff-heavy cabin down below. Bye-bye.